All right, welcome back to the channel, guys. So I have a few updates for the Wired Freedom 2024 model. Um, this will be an update to some of my videos previously, as well as, and specifically, the menu settings video that I made. Uh, if you haven't checked that out, go ahead and check it out. I wanted to talk about a few different settings that I found out some new information from a few viewers, and as well as reaching out to Wired directly uh, regarding some of these settings. As soon as I get away from this street here, I'll talk about those in a little bit. I have the battery charged up, but it's not completely filled up all the way till the light turned off on the charger. So we're at 65.5 volts. I believe it could go a little bit further till the light comes on, but I didn't have enough time to get it completely charged up. And I also like to leave my batteries just under the full, full charge and is kind of away from the very low end of the battery. If you've ever done RC cars or used any lithium, especially LiPo batteries, lithium polymer, this I believe is a lithium ion battery. So it's a little different, but you basically do not want to leave them fully charged. Unlike a lead acid battery from a car, like a 12 volt battery for a normal uh, internal combustion engine car, you don't want to leave it fully charged because that will very quickly deplete the longevity of the cells and it just doesn't like to be fully charged or fully discharged. One way I kind of explain this to my kid who's seven years old is, you know, it's like your stomach. You don't want to be completely starving and you don't want to be really full because both are painful. And it's the same thing for battery cells for lithium. They like to be somewhere in the middle. So you ideally want to be between 20 and 80% on the battery. Now, now that we're away from some of the traffic noise out here, I just wanted to talk to you guys briefly about some of the settings that I spoke of earlier. One of them is the um, motor temperature sensor. Now somebody left a comment on the last video saying that the 2024 model does indeed have a motor temperature sensor, and it does. If you look here at my screen, you'll see that the temperature outside, the ambient temperature is 60 degrees, whereas the motor temperature is up to 77. Whoops. Gotta watch where I'm going. Um, you'll notice that the motor temperature sensor is up to 77 already. Now I've already kind of rode away from my house a little bit before I started the video, but they both start out at about the same exact temperature and then the motor temperature very quickly starts to go higher, obviously, because it's under load. Now, I think this is as good a spot as any for me to pull out my notes. I wanna make this brief because I know it gets boring listening to people talk like this sometimes, but first thing, <laughs> of course, Okay, so one of the first settings is for the P5 setting. Um, you want to set it to 6, not to 16. In my video for the menu options, I said put it to 16. That is if you have a 2023 model with the LG cells. Now, when I spoke to Wired, I didn't mention exactly what model I had, and I guess they just assumed I had the older version. But if you have the new 2024 Wired Freedom like I have, put it to 6. Do not put P5 to 16. It'll be okay, but you're voltage meter on the bike will be wrong and it won't be very accurate so another way to check too is if you look on the side of the battery you'll see that it has samsung cells in it as opposed to lg so if you look quickly on mine you'll see here that it says samsung cells right here so this is where you'll notice it if you're looking on your battery another interesting thing about this battery real quick is that it's offset so it's offset to one side more than the other which I'm not a huge fan of it. It doesn't really get in the way when you pedal or anything, but it's just kind of a weird design. I don't know why it's really like that. I guess because this is such a big battery, there isn't a common bike frame rack that will hold the battery very easily. Also, it kind of clicks in sideways at an angle, which I'm not really a huge fan of either. I'd rather it slide down into its position, but it seems to be working fine as you know, time goes on, I'll let you know. The C5 setting. So beware of where, and the reason I write that is because you're gonna put a lot more power into the motor and the gears if you have it set to 10 on this C5 setting. And this is your power ramp setting. So what I've noticed is uh, that 10 was a little high, so I actually set mine down to five. I believe this comes at set to four factory, which I think is fine also. Uh, one, two, and three are full power, but they'll slowly ramp up as opposed to just letting all the power out at once. What I've noticed is if you do four, five, six, seven, all the way up to 10, it doesn't give you more power. It doesn't even necessarily give you more power all up front. What it does is it takes away the lag. So the way I have it set now, you can kind of twist it and let go and it doesn't really do anything. But if you have it set to 10, as soon as that starts to move even a millimeter, you go. So it's almost, I want to call it a delay. It seems like a delay more than a power ramp. If you want it to 
be where you full throttle and it slowly starts to accelerate up to full power, one, two, and three are gonna be the number that you wanna use for that C5 setting. Okay, the final one here is the C8 setting. It does have a motor temperature sensor, like I said. So set that C8 setting to one, and what you'll see is this MOTT. And what that is, is that's the motor temperature as opposed to temp, which is just the ambient air temperature. So like I said before, when I was riding, it was up at 77 and it's already cooled back down to 68. Kind of cool, you can keep track of it. We're gonna see what that temperature gets up to under a full speed load. Uh, speaking of, another thing I have in my pocket that I'm gonna turn on right now is this uh, GNSS performance analyzer from SkyRC. And all this does, it connects to the satellites and it'll tell you your GPS speed. So I'm using this because I wanna be able to cross confirm the top speed and also the accuracy of this speedometer with the 29 inch tires. So all I have to do is, as you can see, it has the 12 satellites going, it shows the percentage and everything, Bluetooth. I'm gonna do track, which will, keep, um, which will keep track of the distance that we travel. And we're also gonna be able to see the top speed and all that. And it'll also, I believe it'll also track the average speed. So we'll be referring back to this when we go to top speed. Like I said, I'm gonna keep this piece in my pocket. It's really cool, USB um, micro charging point. It's kind of an older version, but if you're interested in this, I can leave a link on a comment for you or in the description if you're interested in buying one of these. Kind of cool to have. I used to use them for my RCs. I also have an RC channel uh, called RC Lee, if anyone's interested, take, take a look at that as well. Finally, we had some other comments um, in the last videos about charging. Can you charge from this particular bike? Yes, you can. There is a USB port on the right side of the display. This is located underneath the display right here and it has a rubber grommet. And then here on the battery, underneath this, you also have a USB port as well. So you can charge directly from the battery if you need to charge your phone or a device like a camera. And you can also charge directly from the display as well. Finally, there is a trip meter along with the top speed and average speed. So you just toggle that center button. And I'm gonna show you that right now. Go ahead and turn the bike on. And you can see if you press this, this center button right here, it will toggle between your average speed, AVS, and it will also give you your MXS, which is your max speed. We're gonna watch this motor temperature sensor. Uh, we're also gonna watch the top speed here in a second. And like I said, it does have the ability, this TTM, which is your um, total time, as well as the odometer. So you have the odometer here, and when you cycle over, it goes to distance, DST, which is your total distance that's on the bike. So you have the ability to reset those as a trip odometer and a long-term odometer as well. We had a question about that. I just wanted to address it. Okay, so here we go. Now remember, with the settings I have it set to, you may go up to your throttle and twist it and be like, oh no, it's not working, what's going on? You'll see throttle pop up on the menu. I don't know if you guys can see that there, telling you you are throttling, but when you're set to zero on PAS, it protects it from being able to go so you have to be in at least one in order for that throttle to work and then it'll kick in. So don't forget that. You may think something's broken or something's wrong with your bike. It's not, again, it's just a setting. So first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna set this to, let's try two for pedal assist. And I'm gonna bring out this GPS speed meter again. And what I wanna see is how accurate is the speedometer to the GPS speedometer. What does it say? Okay, so right now we're both at 14. Let me stand up so you can maybe see that better. Cruising at about 15.2 and it says 14.5, 14.6, 14.0. We're slowing down a little bit. So it seems to be pretty accurate. There's a slight delay from the GPS because it takes a second to read the information, but it looks like if I can try and hold this speed steady here, let me see if I can hold it real steady. Okay, we're at 14 and 13.1, 13.3. So just a slight variation, maybe a half a mile an hour between the two, which is not bad. When we get up to this top speed, I'm gonna go ahead and take this out again if I can and try to measure that. So, you guys are watching this video on Saturday. I'm gonna try to post a video every Saturday to this channel. Again, if you wanna check my other channel, RC Lee, I'm gonna post a video there every Sunday. And that's R-C-L-E-E, -E, like Bruce Lee. All right, I'm gonna shut up so you can hear how quiet this is off-road. Look at that, beautiful. And yes, these aren't huge bumps or anything like that, it's just a little bit of dirt, but 
no rattles, no noises. I do notice every once in a while, I get a little tiny bit of rattle from the, uh, from the kickstand. It's really nice to have something that's smooth and quiet like this. Now that I've gotten everything dialed down, it's great. So I'm gonna shut up again for a few seconds and let you guys listen. A little bit of a chain rattle there. But it is so amazing to have just extra power right at that throttle anytime you need it. So hit that like and subscribe button if you guys enjoy this content. Like I said, I will be taking out my uh, Suron here shortly to some other spots. I wanna go to the desert with it. I wanna take it in some other trails I know of that there aren't as many people around to kind of bother. But like I said, I really appreciate it. We're almost at a thousand subscribers. I really wanna make every week, I wanna make new and exciting content um, and give you an honest review of this bike. Uh, one thing I also noticed if you're doing a lot of off-roading with this is because of the 56 tooth front chain ring, it is pretty close to the ground. I'm gonna show you when we go over a stump up here that I found yesterday. It gets really close because it is so big, it hangs down a lot further than a normal bike would. So if you're going over, oh, there's squirrels everywhere. So if you're going over really um, rutted, heavy, you know, tree roots and you're, you think you can go over a branch, or I'm sorry, like a, a fallen tree or something like that, be careful because you may hit that front chain ring um, you know, and it, it's sure it's metal, but I don't know. I would just be cautious because it, uh, it definitely can, can hit. And that would be a bummer to dent that or to mess that up and have to buy a new one. They're not the most common size, a 56 tooth front chain ring like that. It's gigantic. And, you know, like I said, it's, it's one of the weaknesses for heavy duty off-roading. You are going to have that a lot lower than you would on a normal, you know, 48 tooth chain ring on the front. A little jump right here. A little front tire lift. That's so sick that you can hold throttle and if you lift the front tire, it just, once that back tire starts spinning, it just holds it up in the air. It's so fun and so different than a 750 watt bike. And I'll take a look at it. Also, if you have any questions about this bike in particular, be sure to leave a comment below. I will respond to every single comment out there, guaranteed. Okay, so one of the things I wanted to show you guys is, and this isn't really it, but this is just a rock. And you can kind of see how, you know, you're closer than you would be because of the size of this front chain ring than you would be on a normal size front chain ring bike. So that is one downside to the larger chain ring. But in my opinion, for what I'm gonna be using the bike for, I love having the bigger chain ring because you don't have to feel like an idiot pedaling like a maniac trying to keep up with the speed of the bike itself. And the bike does something cool too when you, I don't know if you guys would be able to hear it, but when you throttle and let go, it goes woo, woo, like it kind of spins down on its own in a freewheel. Almost like a spooled turbo spooling down. I don't know if you heard that woo, it makes like a little woo noise. It's pretty cool sounding. All right, here's some pretty heavy duty stuff here. And again, these four inch fat tires really take a lot of the abuse out of it, along with the full suspension. So I'm just twisting throttle up this. I'm not even pedaling. As you can see there. All right, we're coming up to the crest here of the lake. I think I'm gonna go ahead and change batteries. Oh, have my pedal down there, see? Pretty easy to hit. Here's another example of this chain ring issue. I'm gonna put the kickstand down so you guys can take a look at this briefly. So this isn't too bad, but you can kind of see that your clearance there is, is reduced. And there's no other protection. It's a very thin uh, chain ring as well. Okay, we just checked the battery. It's still at 59%, so I'm just going to go ahead and leave it for now. Beautiful spot here at the lake. I'm out in Folsom, over here by Folsom Lake. If anyone has a bike like this or wants to do any off-roading together, I'm up here. Moved up here a few years ago from Southern California. Don't really have anybody to ride with out here yet. So like I said, leave a comment. If you want to go riding or anything like that, let me know. We can meet up. 
All right, so here's some big rocks right here. So, you know, just gotta be careful with that chain ring, I would say. It's the only real downside for this heavy off-roading stuff. You know, that and the weight of the bike itself. But look at that, it just goes right over it like nothing. Another really cool spot here with all the oak trees. This is the forks of a lake, kind of goes back this way, but there's just trails to ride all throughout this right here. One day I want to go out and down and around and come out onto that peninsula that goes all the way out there to the lake. Let's see if I can scoot forward and give you guys another view of it. There's kind of a peninsula that goes out that way. And let me know down in the comments below if you can hear me well. I have this mic with a dead cat on it which seems to block the wind pretty well. Um, but let me know if there's any audio issues or if you have trouble hearing me at certain points or if there's too much wind noise, I'd appreciate it. I'm gonna shut up and let you guys hear it go over these rocks and bumps here. So that sound I was talking about, it's kind of like a blow off valve on a turbo. Like it kind of, like a slight whistle almost, like a little gear noise of it just, just spooling down in the motor. Kind of cool, I'm not sure what that is. If it like, as soon as you left the throttle, it free wheels and it disconnects, but that's what it sounds like it's doing. Okay, here is the branch that I was talking about yesterday. Now, I would normally just go over this in my bike without any issues or concerns. And what I want you guys to see here is that, you know, that's not even that big of a tree. I guess it's a tree branch that fell over, but look at how close that is, you know? Could it do it? Yes. You know, could you also scrape if you go in the wrong spot? Of course. And so, you know, if you came out over here and you went a little wide, I mean, look at that. Let's look at it. Huh. You're gonna, you're, you know, you're almost gonna hit that chain ring and it's gigantic. So you can even see some spots here on this side of the wood where it looks like other people have possibly hit their chain rings uh, on other bikes. And you know, you go up and then you come down and if you have your suspension going, your suspension is gonna kind of sag as you, as you come down and that's when you're gonna hit right here. And if you notice, it's very thin. It's not a gigantic heavy duty chain ring. There's no guards on it. In fact, there's not even a guard behind it from derailing. So this can come off of this chain guide here and just, just fall off this chain ring. There's no chain guide on it on the, on the front there. So this can potentially come off and you know, you do have this right here, the controller, just slightly warm. But like I said, you know, be aware of that because if you damage this and bend it, you're not gonna be having a good day. So as much as this may be really fun to off-road, is it the ideal off-roading bike? No, you know, I'd say there's better options out there. Can it do it? Absolutely. You know, like anything, it has its limitations. Again, the reason I love this bike is the $2,000 price point, full suspension, hydraulic disc brakes, you know, all the things that I would like to have as creature comforts so that I can go top speed, I can go on rocks like this and off-road. It's, it's a go anywhere, do anything bike. It's not the best at any one thing, but for the price point, I think it has the best overall combination of features for the price point. So again, I'm just gonna shut up and let you guys listen to this off-road. Cut through here. I love this single track stuff, oh boy. Super fun. Let me get back into a harder gear so I can pedal a little faster here. Still had it in the easier gear from going up the hill. Man, this bike is so much fun. So like I say, if you're nervous about pulling the trigger on this bike, don't be, I wouldn't be. 
And from everything I've heard, anyone with any concerns, Wired has been, I don't want to say phenomenal at their customer service, but they're great. They're excellent. You know, they are, will reach right back out to you. In fact, if you want to go order one or you do, uh, try to send a message on their website to their chat box that comes up. You can get responses from that really quickly without being a customer or anything like that. And it's easy. You don't have to call anyone. You don't have to wait online or, you know, wait for any responses, this and that. They will email you when the chat gets updated with the response. So you don't even have to sit on the website and wait for the chat response. You just go about your day, put in your email, and they will respond to directly to your email with the update. Um, I want to show you guys this area. It's pretty cool. It's a little, little horse trough for water. So you can give your horses some water if you're out here riding. People do the boarding on the lake, which is the, the horses and stuff. There's a place down here that allows you to ride horses so you can bring your horse in and you know hose them down, clean them off. Nice bathrooms. You can see here, they got the horses and the horse trailer going. And then there's a little corral, a little okay corral, where you can kind of tie up your horses and eat lunch if you need to. I'm actually gonna take a second here to change my battery because I think now it's low enough that it'll be worth it. You can see here Folsom Lake Trail Patrol 1979 to 99 Folsom Lake California State Park. Check out all the moss on this rock here pretty cool. And this is a tree. I'm guessing it's an oak tree like all the others around it here that fell over at one point with the wind that we had last year probably. You can just see that bad boy on its side. Now the oaks here unfortunately have really shallow root systems because we haven't been getting a lot of rain and so a lot of the trees have have shallower roots that don't go very deep and then when we get deep rains heavy rains it starts to the roots start to go a little deeper to chase that water but from what i've heard from all the people that live in the area that's kind of why all these trees blew over with the wind it's just absolutely beautiful here i love it all right, I'm going to go ahead and change this battery out and get right back with you. So let's take a look at the numbers here. Again, all that moisture looks like it came out of the screen, which is great. 62 degrees on the uh, ambient temperature, 158 on the motor temperature sensor. So again, hit that uh, menu again and add the motor temperature sensor to put it to one if you're interested and you want to be able to see what that uh, temperature is and keep track of it. Again, I don't really know what the purpose is because it'll automatically shut down when it gets too hot, but you are able to monitor it. It's winter time now, so not as big of a deal, but I think when the temperatures go up and I'm riding in 100 degree temperatures, this motor temperature sensor may be more important to kind of watch in order to keep you know things from overheating. 62 volts on the battery, so we're definitely seeing a little bit of drop there. Uh, man, it's so fun. It really reminds me, I used to ride dirt bikes a lot when I was young. I had a 125 when I was really young, two stroke. Then I got a 250, then I got a 450. It was fuel injected by Yamaha in 2013. And, you know, now I got the Suron Ultra, which I absolutely love, but they all serve a different purpose, you know? All right, so we're gonna try and hit this top speed one more time on this wide open road here. Let's go ahead and see. It's only at 61 and a half volts, so it's definitely low. It should be closer to 66 or 67, fully, 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 you know, charged up, which is gonna affect that top speed doesn't really affect the low end very much, I don't think, but it definitely affects the upper end. One thing I want to try and make sure though, I'm going to turn that C5 up to 10 because I want to see if that actually affects the top speed or not. I don't think it does. But just for power purposes, I can get off the road here. Just for power purposes, I want to send this up to C10. So if you can see that there, I'm going to set that to C10. Push that center button again. It takes us back out to the main menu. Okay, so temperature now is 66, 64 degrees. Depending if we're in the sun or not, it kind of gets a little warmer ambient. But motor temperature is at 172. So it is definitely up there. Um, let's go ahead and see what we can get up to here, okay? So we'll put this up to 5. All right, 26. 30. Now I'm not even pedaling. I'm barely just rotating the pedals. 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 30. I saw 
All right, so I do want to say I could be wrong about that C5 being a uh, lag, basically like a lag in the throttle and how quickly it goes. It seems like we went a lot faster there because that was slightly even uphill. That wasn't even downhill. This is downhill right here. So to compare, let's double check, might as well. Let's turn that back down to C5. That C5 back down to um, five. And let's see, no pun intended, if we're able to go the same speed, even going downhill, because that's really gonna tell us whether or not this makes a difference. All right, so now we're at five on the C5. Let's see. We should be able to hit that same, I think 38.4 is what flashed. We'll check it at the end here on the max speed. We'll also check that GPS speed meter. Okay, here we go. All right, actually, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go up to this stop sign because I don't wanna blast through it, not at this speed. And then we're gonna go down this hill and see by the time we get to that trailer up there, if we can hit that 38.4 again. It's downhill. I mean, this is a pretty significant downhill and then uphill. So we're gonna see, here we go. We're gonna see if we can hit that same top speed. It definitely is accelerating a lot slower off the line. Look at that, we're only at 30, 31, 32, 33. Wow, so it does make a difference. Okay. All right, interesting. So, update number two. Put that C5 to 10 if you really want to be able to hit a top speed of 38 you know, miles an hour or whatnot, depending on your weight. I'm going to turn this off again, and I'm going to go back to the same stop sign we were just at with the C5 setting set to 10. And I'm going to see if it's a different speed on the exact same spot. Okay, C5 setting set to 10. Now, let's turn around. Remember to put your, every time you come out of the menu settings, it'll, it'll put your pedal assist back down to zero. So you have to turn it back on to have throttle again. Yeah, I can feel the ramp up. It ramps up a lot quicker, obviously, set to 10 than it does to five. So that's really interesting because I thought only one, two, and three let out the power more slowly but still let you get to top speed. I don't even think at five, and this is just my opinion, my experience, I don't even think that C5 setting set to five is letting the full power out because I was able to hit a lot higher top speed, honestly pedaling not nearly as hard as I did have to to get to 33. So we're gonna start in the same spot we were just at from a dead stop. Eh, you know what, let me go over to the stop sign a little bit and get a little more room. The thing is that's really, you know, it just lets a lot of power out right away. So if you're off-roading and you like to use your throttle once in a while, be careful with it it's set to C10, it's really twitchy. Okay, 61.3 volts, so we're even lower now. Motor temperature is down to 168 from where it was, which is interesting. Probably all that wind cooling it down because it's not that hot outside. Let's see if we can hit 38. Let's see if we can hit 38 down the same exact stretch of road that we were just at and we were only able to hit 33. Okay, so just pedaling, you can see we're already up 24, 25, 30, 1, 32, 3, 34, 35, 30, okay, so 35 and a half. So a little bit, we're starting to go uphill now, but I think I'm going to leave my C5 setting set to 10. And even though it's a little twitchier and a little harder to maybe use when you're at slower speeds, if you want to be able to go the top speed on the roads, on road like this, I think you need to have that C5 setting set higher. That's just the only way to do it. That's just the only way to do it. Um, and it's inconvenient to stop and toggle that when you're ready to go fast and then toggle it back down. It'd be interesting if you had a way to kind of on the fly change that setting, it'd be really cool. Kind of like, you know, actually they do have a setting. I think you can set like I said before, my menu settings video, take a look at that if you haven't already. You can have the throttle tied to your pedal assist speeds, I believe. I have it set to let out all the power at any time. 
but I think you can set that to where it'll re it'll limit it at slower speeds, which would be nice for off-roading. Honestly, I never even thought of that earlier, but might be handy to have that to where then you just go up to five on pedal assist five and you'll have all the power you need when you're going fast, but then turn it down to pedal assist one or two when you're off-roading and you won't have all that constant twitching, jumping out at you. All right, this is a heavy downhill spot. Let's see how fast we can get going. The battery is not fully charged. C5 setting is set to 10. Let's see if we can get this thing to 38 or even 39 miles an hour. 37, 38, 39, 40. There it is, folks. I saw a 40 flash for a second. Of course, it's downhill. Now we're maintaining 38. Yes, 40 miles an hour. Now, I know it's downhill. It's kind of cheating, but the battery's not even fully charged. As you can see, we still have all four bars, but it's probably getting close to three bars now. We've probably gone seven miles, maybe close to eight. I'm barely pedaling at this point and we're going 33, almost 35 miles an hour. 38, pretty awesome. Now we're going uphill. All right, so there it is. Hit that like and subscribe button if you guys haven't already. I really appreciate it. Leave a comment below. Ask me any questions you may have. Thanks for watching. Okay guys, I wanted to mention one more thing that I just noticed. I had to switch my battery there. Looks like when you get down to about 60 volts or so is when you lose that first bar. At least that's when it's showing on mine. Uh, but while I was riding, I noticed if you want to get the, mo the motor power right here that's in watts, if you want to get that all the way up to 2000 or 2200, like I guess it states that it, it can do. I was noticing when I had that C5 setting, um, when I had that C5 setting set to um, to five, I wasn't getting the 2000 Watts, the 2200 Watts. When I set that C5 setting up to 10, I was seeing 2000 Watts coming out of it 2100. So not only does it allow you to go a little bit faster top speed, if you have that C5 setting up to 10, but it also is going to allow you to get the maximum power into the motor, not just off the line, not just ramped up, but the total power that the motor will get is increased by having that c5 setting set to c10 so if you leave it set to c5 like i said at the beginning of this video it will ride a little bit smoother it'll basically ride like a 1500 watt uh, bike and it will also probably make the bike last longer and not use as much power but if you want to get that total power out of it in the 2000 watts plus you need to have that c5 setting set to 10. So as you can see there, you're at, we're at 2,000 watts. And I'm not pedaling hard, I'm just barely pedaling. But it's allowing all that power to go to the motor. So if you want that top speed, you're gonna need to have your C5 setting set to 10. Now is it, that's what I wanna let you guys know. Thanks for watching. Okay, I know I keep saying this, but one last thing. I've also noticed that if you remember on my previous videos, my rear brake was having a little bit of a squeal. There's no longer any squeal in the rear brake. Uh, I think that the pads finally just fully bedded in, which the bedding in process is just the brakes leave a little bit of film material that they put on the outer coating of the brake pad to basically get seated on the rotor. And that helps create a perfectly flat, smooth surface from the rotor to the brake pad itself. It's called bedding in the brakes. And uh, I've noticed now a little bit of a squeak, but not nearly as bad as it was before. Uh, and I think that's gonna be all but completely gone here shortly, as you can see here. Pretty quiet. I mean, there's a little tiny bit of squeal, but not like it was before. So anyways, I promise that's the final update for this video at least. Stay tuned for the next one. I appreciate it. See you next time.